because he gave the tutorials. But let me just briefly introduce Song Hang Nim. So Song Hang Nim got his PhD in KAIST and had a uh, postdoctoral research activity in KK under the Professor Miyoko Nojiri and now in the Rockhurst University under David Shi. So here talk about the measuring galactic dark matter through the unsupervised machine learning. Please start. Yeah, thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, just a second, can you hear me? Oh, can you hear me? No. Hello. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Ah, okay, okay, it's working. Uh, yeah, I'm just double checking the microphone. Ah, okay, so thank you for the nice introductions. And today I'm just, uh, I, I just introduced of my recent work, collaborated with uh, people at the Rockus, uh, Professor Matt Buckley, uh, Eric Putney, and, and De Professor David Shi. And for this work, we we try to apply the uh, we try to apply machine learning techniques for the astronomical data analysis, and in particular, we try to use the we try to identify the the, the galactic dark matter uh, galactic mass density using the using the data set provided by uh, some experiment. And so, so let me start. Uh, mm. So last month, uh, the Gaia satellite provides a new data set. Uh, which contains a uh, contains a uh, various information about the stars near the sun, and yeah, they, they uh, this is uh, just a just a just a table of the number of the available information in the data set. As you see, uh, they they just provide a huge number of the data set, and and this can be very very useful. This can be very uh, fun playgrounds for doing many uh, many physics inference analysis, and. In particular, uh, one, one thing I got interested in it was that uh, since all the stars, all these stars are on, moving under the gravitational field of the Milky Way, so in principle, if you could utilize the this, uh, the kinematic information of of each stars in this data set, we could uh, we could retry, uh, we could identify the gravitational fields of the Milky Way, and and also uh, we we could convert this into the uh, mass density of the Milky Way. Mm. So, uh, so this is a, just a very quick idea, and we try to use solve this problem using machine learning. And and of course, uh, then why why doing this kind of thing is important, uh, especially why, why measuring dark, galactic dark matter is important. Uh, well, one obvious thing is that this is a really the direct input to the uh, direct detection experiment, uh, because uh, because direct detection experiments really really consider the a dark matter around Earth uh, colliding with the nucleus in the experiment, and also these kinds of things are very important for understanding the dark, dark matter halo of the Milky Way. So, so we can understand some dark matter physics using these kinds of data analysis, and also uh, this this method also this this kind of analysis also uh, provides us a direct way of measuring the uh, mass density away from the sun solar solar position, so that uh, this kind of thing can be used for testing the Newtonian gravity uh, in a location away from the sun. So, for example, if 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 if, if our analysis give us a consistent results with the Newtonian gravity, uh, our result can be interpreted uh, as uh, you know, excluding the alternative gravity solutions like uh, modified gravities and so on. So, I, I think this analysis is very interesting. And so. So this is a quick summary of uh, the problem I'm going to solve. So, so the left hand side is uh, just the distribution of uh, the, the position and velocity distribution of stars in the in the data set, and the right hand side is we just want to convert this into the dark matter and the dark matter mass density distribution. And 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 the conventional analysis, uh, if you of course uh, of course there are some conventional analysis for doing this, uh, but and we'll see that these problems actually very complicated. So the conventional analysis typically assumes um, a convention in order to do some conventional analysis, they have to simplify the problem as much as possible. For example, uh, they have to assume some symmetric structure. Or, uh, uh, they have to assume some symmetry, such as, uh, uh, for example, the, the for example, uh, spiral galaxy have some some approximate axis symmetry. So you, you can assume the axis symmetry in the data analysis, and also you can assume some physics models in order to simplify the the dark matter densities 
uh, into some into some parametric models so that you can later on you can just do some parametric fittings for identifying the dark matter densities. Uh, okay, so uh, okay, so what? But of course, one obvious way to measure the galactic dark uh, galop, was gravitational field is just to, just just to tracing the stars and find out orbits and calculate its acceleration. Uh, this is this looks really trivial, but in the galop, in the galactic scale, uh, this it is this is not a feasible way of measuring the uh, uh, galactic gravitational field because what we only have is just a, a single snapshot of the Milky Way because the uh, was it this orbit the time scale of, of orbit is really long, and and that means uh, we have a kinematic information of the stars but not the orbits. Uh, so, 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 just the directly solving the was it the Newton's equation is not not the solution for this problem. But, but of course, uh, there are some alternative way of so solving this problem because we have lots of star. Uh, we have a uh, we have lots of measured stars, and and one way of solving this problem is the assuming that uh, was it the system uh, interaction between stars are less relevant. Uh, I mean, uh, the the stars are, are approximately collisionless, and that. And and more practical way of understanding this gravitational system with a large number of particles is that using the phase space densities and assuming that all the stars are are IID uh, within this distribution, and then and then and then each stars in the data set then simply can regard it as a as a just a just a random sample drawn from this phase space densities, and. As soon as you have this this phase space density, uh, you can solve the equation of motion, uh, which is called the collisionless Boltzmann equation, and and this equation is just a, again a function of the function of acceleration. So that by solving this equation, you can identify the uh, you can identify the the math, uh, the gravitational acceleration field, and you, and after then by solving the Gauss equation, you know to convert this acceleration into the mass density. Mass density field. Okay, so so the first thing what we have to do is uh, then just the density estimation, right? But uh, as we saw in the previous le uh, le lectures and tutorials, uh, machine uh, machine running is really good at doing these kinds of a multi high dimensional density estimation. Although this is uh, just a sixty density estimation, but but still, uh, machine learning can do this kind of thing very well. And and of course, as I said, uh, uh, this is not only the way of solving this problem. So, and also there are some, I, I, I mentioned that there are several classical way of solving this problem. So, so these are the list of the, these are list of, uh, these are list of the, the, the dark matter mass densities uh, measured, uh, measured at, at the sun uh, using the, using various classical methods. And, and as you see, uh, the, the most of the upper, upper upper estimation is the old measurement, and the lower part is approximate. Roughly speaking, it's a it's a more more recent measurement. And and each of the analysis actually doing some physics. Uh, 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 each of the analysis is just a, a model based approach, so it's, it's essentially a parametric model. Uh, they just do the parametric fitting, and so and. As you see on this plot, the, the results are quite precise. But if you, as soon as you consider the error bars of each each dots, uh, as you see, as you can see, uh, some of the results are not compatible to each other. Uh, and this means that uh, the underlying assumption, although we have a lots of data set, but but underlying assumptions are uh, underlying assumptions of each analysis might be too conservative. So that uh, they may 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 generate a uh, somewhat biased result. So, so in order to overcome these kinds of biasness in the analysis, uh, of course, the uh, one one thing you definitely could try is that just releasing those kinds of assumptions. And for that purpose, uh, since classical anal analysis is not capable of doing that, uh, our machine learning approaches uh, could generate uh, some sort of unbiased result for doing these kinds of mass test estimations. So we need analysis without us, without assuming this kind of symmetries and the models. And 
Okay. So actually, there, there are so there are several. You, yes. Uh, can you uh, list some kind what kind of the model assumed? Uh, so models. Uh, so I uh, I can highlight all the models, but 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 uh, but roughly speaking, uh, uh, for dark matter distribution, they use uh, they use some profile uh, the families of the profile called NFWs, and also they just do some analytic modeling on the on on the on the Milky Way, uh, the, the stellar distribution of the Milky Way, such as they just use analytic form of the bulges and the disks and the and the spirals. And they, after then, using these models, they do some parametric fittings using the maximum likelihood estimations. Yeah, that, that's how, how the classical analysis are done. Uh, is it okay? Okay, then, yes, yeah, let me continue. So, yeah, there are actually several groups are working on this. Uh, so as I said, the reason to uh, progress in machine learning allows to us to estimate these probability density functions in high dimension with a very high fidelity. And, and in our, uh, for in our group, we first proved this kind of approach is applicable in the using the embody simulations, and and now we are working, we are trying to apply this method to the real data uh, the, for the real data analysis provided uh, by the Gaia dataset. And and again, as as a proof of concept uh, in this paper, uh, in in our previous work, we just tested this idea using an embody simulated galaxy. Uh, so this is a, just a quick outline of strategies. So we just grab our some some. So first of all, we just grab some stars near the sun, uh, in in an embodied simulated galaxy, and we use a neural network to estimate the density of the the phase space density of the stars, and after then we solve the solve the equation of motion, which is the Boltzmann equation, to to find out the to identify the uh, the gravitation acceleration field. And after that, we uh, we are going to solve the Gauss equation to find out the mass densities. And yeah, so this is just a quick outline of our strategy. So, and are people people jumping into more details? Do you have any other questions? If not, uh, okay, then let me just continue. And uh, again, yeah, any any kind for any kinds of astrophysics talks, uh, you can if you cannot think about any talks without videos. So this is just a quick visualization of the uh, our embody simulation data set, which is called H277, the galaxy H277. So this is just showing the history of how this H277 is forming in, in these embody simulations. So, so initially we didn't assume any kinds of symmetries. So we just really calculate, uh, I, it's not my calculation, but, but I just downloaded the data set provide uh, uh, provided by, by my collaborators. So, yeah. So they so, so they start to form a small cluster and just uh, they just collecting some small cluster nearby. And at the end, it just forms some some spiral like structures. And at the end, as you see, it just form a form a very Milky Way like uh, Milky Way like galaxy. So. Okay, so we just place us on uh, in some uh, in a in a position, at some position. Uh, so we we exact we exactly put the sun at the. We just uh, put the sun in this blue point, and we just grab uh, grab the samples, uh, within this this blue ball, and the upper, and the upper figure is the just the, just the the oh what is it. This one is the stellar, stellar uh, the distribution of the stars, and the lower part is the, the actually uh, what well, lower part is the distribution of the gas, and and actually uh, this this simulation is comp uh, consists of of three components, uh, which uh, the first one is just the stars, uh, star particles, and the second one is of course dark matter, and the third component is the uh, the gas which is responsible for creating the dark. Uh, creating uh, a star, uh, the popping of the stars, and and of course the star, the distribution stars that looks relatively regular, but this 
discuss this during the summer turbulence because it 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 does uh, electromagnetic interactions and other complicated things happening in here. Uh, but we will see that uh, although there are some some kinds of uh, these kinds of irregularities in the distribution, we will see that our method uh, could estimate uh, mass density in, in a uh, with relevant precision. So can I ask what H two seven seven means? Uh, uh, that I don't know actually. I ha I haven't asked to my collaborator yet. But uh, David, do you know? Mm. Yeah, actually, I don't I don't know what the meaning of H two seven seven is. Okay, mm -hmm. let me continue then. I I would just add that you know these are the state of the art n body plus hydrodynamical simulations of galaxies that uh, <clears throat> people are doing these days. And there's sort of at least three groups doing them. Um, and this is one of the three groups. I mean, there might be more than three groups, but I'm aware of three oh. groups doing them. Yeah, this is from one of those groups. Happens to be Matt Buckley's wife. So we have an in inside track on this one. Hmm. Okay. Okay, then let me just continue then. Uh, so this is just a quick explanation about our data set. So our data set just have uh, only uh, 150,000 data sample stars, uh, which is uh, very small compared to the Gaia data set. Uh, as, as, we saw uh, as you saw on the, on the first slide, the Gaia data set consists of more than a millions of the stars. So uh, so uh, we could naively guess that if, if the, our strategy works very well within this this small number of the uh, samples, uh, we we could also expect that uh, this strategy could work well with the uh, with real data set real data analysis too. And and one thing you should be aware of that uh, that the simulation also have uh, its 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 resolution, which is the which is this number. 0.173 kiloparsec. So if you if we try to do something uh, uh, if we try to do something below this scale, you may end up with seeing that just a just a noisy result due to the resolutions. Uh, so so in order to avoid this, we try to do uh, we we are trying to do uh, all the analysis uh, higher than this resolution scale. And okay, so so now now we have a data. And let's let's try to convert this to the phase space density. And in order in, in order to convert the data to the uh, to the phase space density, we use a neural network model called normalizing flow. And uh, let me let me briefly explain what the normalizing flow is again. And and this this is a neural network that learns a, a transformation of the random variables. So so. So let's say we have we have some some n-dimensional Gaussian distributions. We we know how to calculate this probability, and we also know how to sample this. And the normalizing flow flows will learn about how to transform this Gaussian Gaussian distribution into the into the training sample distribution. And and since this is a just a, just a random variable transformation, what you only need to do is to just to calculating the transformation rule and its Jacobian determinant in order to calculate the probability density uh, in the in the target distribution. And after that, you can just use a maximum likelihood estimation method to train this uh, normalizing flow. So, so not, yes, I, I'm sorry to ask, but can you go back to the uh, previous slide? Oh uh, yes, sure. Yes, so here I don't know what this plot means. So can you explain a little bit what this plot Oh, sure. Is? Yeah, yeah. So so this is a, just a distribution of stars uh, uh, within this ball. So 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 this is red dot. Red dot is a solar location, which is a, a x equal 0 0.1 to 2, y 0, z equal 0 0.02, 0 0.8 kiloparsec. And we just grab stars within the radius uh, 3.5. and and this is just the 2D marginal distribution of the stars. So on, for example, in this plot, this is, uh, just a second, I think. Yeah, maybe this one, starting from this one is better. So this, uh, for this plot, uh, this is a plot uh, of X and Z. And, and since uh, our sun is on the, on the X axis, 
so roughly speaking, this X is actually actually the radial distance uh, in, in the gal galactocentric frame. And, and Z is uh, then obviously it's a, it's a distance from the uh, galactic disk. And and the other uh, the other plus are just the other component and and for example this one is uh, this one is this this distribution of stars on x and x and, the marginal distribution of x and y and that means uh, it, if you go into this part you are getting more closer to the galactic center so that you you have more stars and and if you go more further away uh, then you you will see less stars and this is a this is a just a projected thing everything projected to the to the this to the x y plane and that's why the plot looks quite regular along this uh, along this y direction and okay yeah, yeah. thank you yeah. yeah and the other other plus also the same yeah just the y and z plot yeah essentially showing the same thing a very similar thing to the x z plot Okay, so uh, any other questions so far? Uh, no, uh, then let me just continue. So, okay, so so this is just a quick visualization how normalizing flow works, and it really just to, uh, really just to learn how to deform the how to deform the was coordinates uh, in order to convert this base distribution to the target distribution, and. And although the, the idea looks very simple, and, and uh, the, the idea looks very simple, and the neural network is really capable of doing so, and using this uh, coordinate transformation, we can we could calculate the basis space as very efficiently. Okay. And so so this is our first result, and uh, this is just a, a marginal distribution of each component learn, uh, given by the normalizing flow. So here, uh, the black black lines are the histogram of each component, uh, the histogram of the training data set, and I just uh, and uh, and the red line is the is the is the marginal histogram uh, of the data set generated by the normalizing flow. So if if red and black agrees well, that means that uh, we are doing the right thing. So the first plot is the the marginal distribution of x, and the second uh, so second and third are the the marginal distribution of y and z. And as you see, uh, the red and blacks are agreeing each other quite well. And you can also check the similar thing for the velocity distributions, uh, which are the lower lines. So the first one is the the marginal distribution about v x, and the second and third are about v y and v z. And and they looks mostly okay, and 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 since our 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 galaxies are rotating a bit, uh, because of that you can see some non non zero mean values for the the V Y distribution. Um, so the quality of the phase space density looks okay so far. So we can just continue, uh, continue to solve the equation of motion. So. Uh, okay, before solving the equation of motion, let's let me just do, uh, do some quick math. Uh, if you just carefully look this equation of motions, uh, and before we continue, uh, I, we, I just assume the uh, this phase space densities are in equilibrium, so that uh, I just discarded the time derivative terms. So uh, after then, this just this equation just becomes a linear uh, linear system of equation about the acceleration. So in principle, you could solve it, but uh, but if you just consider this equation at a, at a point of uh, in a point of view at each star's positions, uh, a, a point of view of each star, uh, then each star have only one velocity, and that means at the end you, you will have only one equation. So it looks like it's underdetermined system. But if you just uh, just this, consider this as as a, just a whole equation of motions, and and also normalizing flow is able to draw. Uh, draw samples at a given uh, able to draw velocities at a given points uh, and any, and any amounts. So in that sense, uh, uh, you can you can just generate the arbitrary number of the velocity if, if the, any positions are given. And if you try to uh, solve the Boltzmann equation using those generated velocities, uh, this equation is actually overdetermined. Uh, 
so that we, you, you need uh, some other techniques to solve this kind of equation. And, and for solving over the time in the system, uh, the conventional method is just uh, doing the, the chi-square minimization uh, using uh, just uh, just solving the the least square minimizations, uh, uh, which is that uh, just just a just a, just calculate the equational motion and and then take its its square and try to minimize its sum. And in order to solve this, we just draw ten thousand sample uh, ten thousand velocity samples per per given position, and. And, and we just found that this number is roughly enough to suppress the uh, was it? suppress the the statistical error sufficient enough. Mm. Uh, okay, so this is the result. Uh, so this is a, uh, the acceleration what we found, uh, and, and this is acceleration along the x-axis, and, and we just plot uh, uh, versus. Uh, we just plot x versus ax, and and see that since every uh, every every star, uh, I mean, every accel accelerations are heading he heading to the galactic center. We expect that this 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 uh, ax have a negative values, and as you see, uh, it's, it's, at least it's heading in the right directions. And if you if you check the curves very carefully. And here, the, the blank line is the, the simulation truth. And, and in the simulation, we know all the mass, uh, the distribution. Uh, we know all the all the position position of the stop position of the objects. So we could calculate the uh, acceleration explicitly. And the red and the red line, red line is the uh, the acceleration estimated by our method. And and the green line is that we also tried some uh, slightly more classic analysis, which is uh, which which is the genes analysis. Uh, 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 this is also also another alternative way of solving identifying uh, the accelerations. But uh, but one one key difference is that in the in our genes analysis approach, we assume actually we assume some symmetries. Uh, for example, axis symmetries and uh, axis symmetries uh, and uh, and the mirror symmetries about the about the galactic disk plane. So, so this is actually more uh, slightly more constrained analysis. So, so as you, as you see, uh, the black and and reds are agreeing quite well uh, within within five percent. So, so you can see uh, you, now you can see that our our methods are quite working well uh, with this embody simulated data set. And. And this is saying, uh, this is the similar plot, but I just draw the uh, z acceleration uh, at a given z uh, given z position, and and this is a uh, this is uh, what's it? This is the acceleration uh, along the z axis uh, penetrating through the the solar location. So so I just measure the z axis acceleration uh, above and below the sun. So roughly speaking, this dotted line is that then the acceleration uh, at the sun. And as you see, since uh, as you see, since uh, our galaxy, uh, this H two seven seven is a spiral galaxy, uh, so you expect that uh, the the objects uh, uh, away from the disk should be uh, sh uh, should fall into the into the into the disk direction, so that. So for for negative z values, uh, the objects in the negative z values, you expect that, that you expect a positive acceleration. Uh, they will they will experience positive accelerations, and for for objects in in uh, positive z regions, they will they will experience uh, negative z accelerations. And if you again the blues, uh, okay again if you compare the red uh, black. Which is the simulation truth and and red, which is uh, our estimated values. Uh, they they are okay, not going well with with five percent accuracies. And and you can see some you can see that some deviations are uh, deviations are growing quite fast. Uh, if you go 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 away from the uh, if you are going z uh, larger than roughly one point five kiloparsec. But the problem is that uh, in, in in our simulations, 
the number of samples in those regions are very small. So, so essentially, it's, uh, the uh, the statistical uncertainties are dominating this region, so that uh, you cannot do very precise estimation on this region. So that's why yeah, the agreements are getting worse in those those shaded region. But at least for in, uh, at least our est estimation uh, to to accelerate his estimation very well in, in the bulk region, which is which is uh, which is the place near the sun. Uh, this is a just a, just a, some numbers, and if you just compare the, again the, uh, this is just a, a number acceleration at the sun, and I just to show some numbers here, and if you just compare the simulation truths, and he, here I just noted as a smeared, but this is a, actually our final result, and if, if you just compare those two numbers, uh, in in most in all the cases those two numbers are going well within the within the statistical uncertainties and the measurement uncertainties. And, oh, okay, so this is, a, this is I just explained how, how our acceleration estimation works and how, how its quality is. And the next step is, oh, of course. Excuse uh, me. Yes. Uh, can I ask a, a question again? Sure, sure, yeah. Here in this table, this systematics is mm -hmm. very large in the simulation truth. Simulation but truth? No, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good good observation. Mm -hmm. But similar one is very small. So mm -hmm. ah, so uh, okay. So let me just explain what the systematic uncertainties on this table is. Uh, for simulation truth, uh, I previously mentioned that uh, this embodied simulation have a finite resolution, right? Uh, uh since uh, since the object have a finite resolution, so uh, so the the ob each object's the positions are not uh, uh what's it the, each each objects in the, in this embody i mean and the particles in the embodied simulation have a finite width so so we just account this uh, on uh, the uncertainties from this finite distance effect uh, in the in the in the truth ex truth mass the truth acceleration calculations so of course uh, of course, if, if the if the particles and body simulations are exactly the uh, exactly what's it? If there is no resolution and then the part uh, and the and the pa particles in embodied simulations are really the particles, then then the, uh, the then the mass distributions are, are just a just set of delta functions, so everything is clear then. Uh, but but due to this finite resolution, uh, our simulate uh, the simulation truths also have some propagate and uncertainties from them. And for for smart one, uh, this is our, just a really the error propagation from the from the measurement errors. So so actually those uh, those two uncertainties are slightly different. We just but we just group them as a, as a systematic uncertainty systematic uncertainties in this table. Mm -hmm. uh, is it enough? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, okay, now we have accelerations, and they they look reasonably working well, and now it's time to calculate the mass densities using this acceleration field. Uh, but uh, one obvious uh, one obvious thought is that you of course you can just directly calculate the diver uh, the divergence of the acceleration to calculate the to get the mass densities, but but if you just carefully inspect, carefully check the equation, uh, the Gauss equation, actually the the story isn't that simple, because if you just check the left hand side of the equation, which is just a mass density function, and and this is really a genuine pointwise features. But if you consider the right hand side. Uh, the right hand side is the estimated acceleration, and and since we use a fine only a finite sample, uh, and and then the acceleration estimation will have a finite resolution, uh, because uh, because our our training sample have a finite size, and at the end if you just uh, try to calculate the uh, the divergence of this, uh, you will see uh, you may end up with kept catching some noise in the interpolant interpol uh, interpolant, and. So uh, we just uh, make these two things compatible to each other. 
Uh, so in order to do so, we just use a kernel smoothing. So, so if you just convert the kernel to the both right, left-handed and right-hand side, and uh, so essentially these, these are just a smoothing the equation or motion, a, a smoothing the equation. And, and then after applying smoothing, the left-hand left side is uh, now, now the, the smoothened mass density function at, at the kernel bandwidth scale. And the right-hand side is again the smooth, uh, smooth and estimated acceleration at the kernel bandwidth scale. So, so the left-hand side and right-hand side now have a same, same, same length scale. So, so the estimation should be uh, compatible each other. So, so they uh, they give us more reliable results. Uh, so, for for kernel bandwidth. Uh, of course, since our simulation, I have finite resolution 0 0.17. Uh, so, so the bandwidth is slightly larger than uh, this is uh, very ideal for our purpose. But, but as I show in 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 the in the in the in the previous slide, uh, our gas gas densities have quite irregular shape. So we just uh, try to use uh, some a slightly larger. A larger smoothing kernel so that uh, we choose this following bandwidth for each x and y and z direction. So for for x and y direction, uh, we choose uh, five times larger bandwidth, which is a 1.0 1.0 kiloparsec. And for z directions, we don't we have less uh, irregularity, so we just uh, pick a resolution similar to the simulation resolution. So okay, so. So now, now we we are trying to solve this smoothened uh, smoothened Gauss equation to uh, to get the mass density. Hmm? Um, and also another another advantage of using this kernel smooth mass density is that we do not need to evaluate the second order derivatives of the network, uh, uh, because uh, essentially. Uh, derivative calculation is an error amplifying process. So if if we could avoid this, uh, if we could avoid derivative calculation that's always the best and and it, and okay so if we just uh, calcul calculate the, this convolution formula more carefully and you can see that they just expand in this way and uh, and the and the derivatives term can be absorbed into the kernel shape uh, kernels uh, using the gauss's law and and of course the kernel Kernel, we know the analytic form of the kernel, so you don't you don't need to take any numerical differentiation on this. So, so to solve this equation, we do the following: so draw samples from the kernel boundary and kernel itself in order to evaluate these two terms, and evaluate acceleration at this perturbed position x prime, and solve the this Gauss's equation. And and be careful that uh, this is a really time consuming, and 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 if you just calculate the number of the number of the network evaluation uh, for acceleration estimation, uh, I said that uh, previously that we evaluate uh, we draw ten thousand uh, ten thousand samples from the normalizing flow. That means uh, at least ten thousand network evaluations are needed. And in order to solve uh, in order to solve this Gauss equation, we also also draw uh, 3.2 thousand uh, samples from the kernel. And that also means extra 3.2 thousand uh, network evaluations are needed per each, each velocity sample. So at the end, in total, roughly 30, 30 million network evaluations are needed to get a mass density at a single point. And that means it, it's a really there's a computational power demanding process. So, for example, uh, if we do the acceleration estimations, uh, if, if we, uh, at a given point, if we do acceleration estimation, it only takes uh, roughly one minute per point. Uh, uh, just a second, if I remember the number correctly, less than one minute per point. But for but for uh, this mass density calculation, this takes uh, more than two hours per point. Yeah, so be, so be careful. You can, you cannot do this calculation on on, a, on your desktop. Uh, either make your computer bound. 
So, okay, so this is our result. And again, the, the blue, uh, the, the, the black lines are the simulation truth. And the, and the red line is, the, is the, our, our estimation result. And as you see, if you could just compare the, compare the black and the red, uh, they are agreeing quite well within the 10% or 20% or accuracy. And this plot is actually the, the X versus mass density plot. And, and, and because of that, you can see the, the mass density, the mass density are decreasing slightly as you, as you go away from the galactic center. And, and one thing you could notice that this, you can see some small kinks in here, but this is just an artifact actually. Uh, because uh, in the, as I explained previously, in order to evaluate these integrals, we just use Monte Carlo integration so that uh, there are some uh, some statistical uncertainties uh, statistical uncertainties propagated from there. But but overall overall all the results are agreeing within ten to twenty percent accuracy. And you can also do the same uh, same calculation along the z-axis uh, uh, penetrating through the sun. And, and again, if you just compare the red and red and gray, they are occurring quite well. And also, one one interesting thing is that you can really true uh, measure the mass density at at a place away from the sun. And so we can measure the mass density. Uh, so so this is a very interesting factor. Mm. One second. Okay, so uh, so this is a okay. This is the same table. Uh, we just uh, listed the mass density at the at the solar location, uh, and the, and the first uh, first line is the simulation truth value, and and the third line is the our, our simulation our, our our estimation result, and as you see, uh, those two results are occurring well within the within the statistical and systematic uncertainties. So, so it's really nice, yeah. Our method is really working very well, even though we are just playing with a very small number of the stars. Okay, so, so yeah, I just introduced uh, our 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 method uh, our our method for measuring the galactic dark matter, uh, galactic ma uh, mass densities using the using the data containing. The kinematic information of the stars, and we we successfully identified the mass densities uh, using very small number of stars, and now we are really applying this this kinds of techniques for identifying the the mass the galactic mass densities using the the Gaia data set, and and we are now we are doing the real analysis. So we we, we, we I hope that we we could we could publish some more interesting and real results soon. And yeah, thank you for listening. Okay, so are there questions? Thank you for <coughs> um, hmm? In my case, I don't know well about this field, but mm -hmm. so now I want to ask you, the, you said you, uh, you successfully achieved 20% accu accuracy. Mm -hmm. is, is, it, uh, is it good achievement compared to other works? Uh, just like, let me just go back to the tables and uh, I think this one. So of oh, course, yeah. if you just compare these numbers with those so, so some some types of experiment, this 20% 20, 20 accuracy is already good enough. But if you just yeah. compare with some other more precise measurements, uh, the 20% doesn't look Good enough, right? Yeah. Uh, but the problem is that uh, usually those uh, analysis with with 
very small uncertainties that they assume mm -hmm. very uh, very specific models for doing their analysis. That means uh, this is actually the, uh, the, the uh, there is actually uh, so, the, some some something uh, it's called a bias variance trade-off. And mm. if, you, if you assume more strict things, your result will be more precise and have a less uncertainties. Uh, yeah. yeah. But in our case, uh, we our analysis have less assumptions. So that means, uh, of course, if you, if you do the same data, uh, uh, do the same analysis with the same data set, uh, the, the, the uncertainties can be slightly amplified a bit. But yes, yes. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. So oh, it's it's a really just yeah. just a control of the qualities. So you can just assume the more you can just feed more assumptions, then then you will get a more precise uh, precise result. But uh, but uh, but as you see, uh, if you do the too much assumptions, the results are results can be biased. And if you just compare yeah. with the other results, the, since all the results are biased, so the results are not not compatible to each other. Uh, uh, but if you just uh, roughly yeah. consider the twenty percent from zero point four, uh, maybe here. Yeah, I think it's hard to summarize cast the values in within this table. But uh, because uh, the the thing I just to show you is the mass density of uh, the galactic mass density is near the sun, but the, the this table shows the the dark matter density near the sun, so it's, it's actually showing slightly different things. But, uh, but but the important yeah, thing is that this bias trade bias variance trade. Yes, yes. Uh, just uh, I want to ask you what I thought is correct or not. Um, mm. The if we make assumption more weaker, then mm -hmm. we need to uh, contain various more various things. Yeah, you have yeah, to consider so, the more yeah, so things. uncertainty is like, stronger. Yeah, the, the, then the uncertainties yeah. will get larger because it, now you're yeah, starting yeah. to consider more things. Yeah. Ah, yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. So within the constraint space, uncertainty is obviously small because you're you're considering within very small things. Yeah. That's it. Maybe just uh, this is a nice plot. I I don't I haven't I don't know if I've seen it before, but um, oh, they are. <laughs> maybe just to add to what you just said, like mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could take the scatter of points here to be some kind of systematic uh, error in all these different methods, mm -hmm. and in that case, the systematic error is surely greater than twenty percent. It looks like right. Oh, you mean systematic oh. errors of this uh, those experiments or our case? No, these measurements or ah, these measurements, these fits or whatever. Yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the systematics coming from their fit function or their model, you know, mm -hmm. which are not they're not quantifying that here. Mm -hmm. uh, you could take the variation in this plot to be like a measure of that, maybe. Oh uh, yeah, then we can uh, we can do yeah sure sure yeah we can we can just check the variance uh, variation of the, the was it these points and calculate yeah, some kind of a systematic set. So we can just compare it with our values too. Yeah. I mean, going from like the blue plot points at the bottom to the red triangles mm -hmm. in the middle there, it's it's definitely more than twenty percent variation. I think. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, especially if you just compare this and this, it's typically more than twenty percent. Yeah. Hi, so uh, could you show the, your uncertainties on the delta A over A? Delta A over A. Yeah, you had uh, AX uncertainty and AZ uncertainty at the end of your slide. Uh, you mean this one? Uh, yeah, I think you said this was about 5% accuracy over the wide range of X. And also same thing mm -hmm. for delta AZ over yes. the wide range of, yeah, this was order of, uh, five percent, but uh, near the the left side, uh, z equal to minus two, and then plus minus two. Okay, you have a little larger uncertainty. Yeah, they have a larger uncertainty because we don't have much training samples in there. Okay, so that. So it's a purely statistical uncertainty. Yeah. Okay, so that corresponds to the slightly larger uncertainty on the delta rho over rho delta rho as a function of z. I think yeah, it's a good observation. Point. It's uh, just 
the large uncertainty on there is also just the error propagation of this one. But that's a proportion. Okay. That, that's yeah. A, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So if we just go back to here, yeah, now you can see the error is really huge. It's more than 100%. And it's a really, it's, so that's just error propagation of next, uh, yeah, uh, what we saw in the previous video. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Sure, um, yeah. In, in your training, so you train or your network through the simulation, right? Mm, yeah, we, we train network. our network using the data set given by the simulation. Yeah, given by the simulation. And the simulation based on the strong assumption, right? Simulation is based on the strong assumption. Simulation always do some assumption, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Then uh, your, your, your method is biased by the, the assumption. On the uh, no, uh, this is a uh, uh, bias because we do, we did not use simulations for teaching some simulate the feature of the simulation to the new network, but we really just took out the data set from the simulation. And uh, so basically, this is a really unsupervised uh, method, and we we did not retrieve any features of the simulation during the training. So it's a really just a pure density estimation given uh, using the data set provided by the net, uh, provided by the simulation. So if you just consider the supervised uh, supervised mass, supervised version of the this, well, obvious obvious way of uh, uh, one obvious way, uh, supervised method could be just to generate uh, just just a billions of the galaxies and make a pair of the data set. Uh, so, so make a pair of the data set. Uh, for example, a pair. Uh, uh, for for example, stars and the dark matter density pairs, and let the neural networks learn about this. Uh, uh, then, uh, then you're right. Uh, this method is uh, really learning the features about the simulation itself. So it, it's, a, it's there's a simulation bias, but in our case, uh, we we are we we are starting from nothing. Uh, we didn't we did not assume any. Uh, our networks don't know about the, the true stock method density at all. So so there is no 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 no, no simulation bias in this setup. So it's not, a, uh, not that kind of simulation-based regression problem. Can I just add while you're on this plot? I, oh, I sure, this yeah. This plot's really cool because um, the, the reason there's a bump at zero is this is the total mass density, and then the bump at zero is from the stars and the gas. Um, and then as you go out to higher Z, uh, the stars and the gas are much less, and what you're seeing then is the, the dark matter itself. And in fact, that I think, right, Simhawk, that value of 1.5 times 10 to the 7, uh, that is, in this simulation, that is, I mean, sorry, in the usual units, that's something like 0.3 GeV per mm, centimeter cube. Yeah, yeah, roughly, yes. Maybe we could just compare the numbers in the previous table. So. So let's just do the let's just pick up the uh, mass density value at minus one. So this is roughly 0 0.1 kiloparsec, 0 0.1 solar mass per kiloparsec. And if we just to co compare these values to the some roughly speaking, the, the values in here. Uh, oh yeah. So you it's here. Area. Yeah, here. Yeah. So our uh, so our values are showing the mass dark matter density roughly at here, this line. So it's already showing the uh, our results are somewhat compatible with those results. Yeah, here this line. Yeah, the the, the problematic part is uh, just the, uh, the 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 region near the disk. Because now those those regions are the stars, stars and the gas, there are significant portion of the gas and stars, so we really really have to subtract their mass densities very carefully. But for halo regions, I think it's relatively trivial, as David mentioned. Cool. <laughs> yes. So, any other part questions? The Zoom? OK. 
Okay, I think that you you fried our brains already. <laughs> ah, <laughs> I don't okay, know. Thank you, Fanga, and I hope that you thank get you so much. soon. Okay. <laughs>